We are with Joseph J and Naim, and they are going to share about asset right abstractions, a case for smart contract wallets. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Joseph. This is Naim. Uh, we are from a project called Pawn. Uh, and today we are not going to talk about Pawn, uh, but about something that we develop for the community uh, because it's important to us and to our cause. Um, so we are going to talk about asset rights abstraction, our case for smart contract wallets. Um, so I'm the CEO of Pawn, whatever being a CEO means, Naim is a smart contract dev, so he's, the, he's actually the guy who is going to tell you the interesting stuff. I'm, I'm here just as a, a staffing. Um, so first, why? Um, so why did we start, it, uh, start developing a smart contract wallet? In short, Pawn is a, is a generalized borrowing and lending protocol, um, but we also need like, a whole bunch of tooling out there in the ecosystem, and since it wasn't available at the time, um, we, we decided to develop it ourselves. Um, so, in Pawn, our kind of holy grail, what we want to see, what we want to build in the ecosystem, is um, seeing long-term loans, mortgage type of loans, uh, being issued uh, on-chain. So we're looking at like five, 10, 15 years uh, contracts that should last on-chain and, and should be actually, um, you know, perceived as, uh, as legitimate. Like today, what we see in DeFi is mostly short-term or something that will, you know, get set up and can be erase like 30 seconds later. Uh, but we kind of want to get us to the point where people will be able to uh, back their long-term mortgages with digital assets, and this is an important piece of the ecosystem or like piece of the tooling that we need. Um, so uh, we decided to dive into, into smart contract wallets and kind of allow using the assets that you, that you own um, while you're using them to, to back a loan. Uh, but our case, or the case for uh, for our smart contract wallet is, is much wider. So uh, today we are going to dive into that. Um, so most people, I guess, know smart contract wallets as, um, uh, as a multisig or something that allows you to operate a wallet or operate an account as uh, multiple, multiple users, um, but there is much more. So um, depending on your level of uh, you know, um, technical knowledge or just like the, the time you spend in the ecosystem, just a quick rundown what are actually smart contract wallets. Uh, so contract wallets are essentially smart contracts that are creating a proxy um, between a user or like an end user account uh, and another contract uh, with some extra logic added. So there are some, uh, some examples. Uh, why would you use it? So first, you can, uh, you can enable, you can create like more events automations or like call wrappers around multiple contracts uh, and do like more things in one transaction than you would otherwise be able to do. Um, good example for that is Gnosis Safe, or Safe, uh, as it was recently renamed, uh, which uses it for multi-sig interactions. Or another great example is a DeFi Saver um, smart contract wallet, which makes it easier to operate um, in, the, in the DeFi ecosystem. Um, another example would be just general identities. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about uh, decentralized identity standards uh, and a way you can use multiple keys in one smart contract and essentially like use the contract as your on-chain identity. Um, there is a whole bunch of, whole bunch of attempts around the DID, or there is also the Argent wallet, uh, which essentially does a very similar thing. Um, now, smart contract wallets aren't definitely useful for, for everything. They have, they have some uh, downsides, so that's especially the gas overhead, because again, you, you're using an extra proxy, you have to do more computation in every single transaction that you're, um, you're using it for. Uh, and secondary, uh, you may require some level of integration. So EIP 1271 for signed messages would be one example of like what everybody, everyone else has to integrate in order for smart contract wallets to uh, work just as like a user account would. Um, so in our specific case, like why do we want to mess up with, uh, with asset rights? Um, as I mentioned, we want to allow the case where you kind of ha can have your cake and eat it too, where you can have um, assets in your custody, but still create some sort of a deed, some sort of a right uh, for another person to eventually be able to access those assets and, and kind of like take them, um, uh, take, take them with them. So um, 
the, the very basic case for us is essentially creating a hook in the wallet in someone else's account that allows uh, you to essentially drain the wallet uh, if a certain criteria is met, and obviously if the other person consents to it. So they would actually like sign up for that in, in another contract. Um, why is this good? Uh, what is this good for is that you don't actually have to move those assets that you have in the account. You can just create this like uh, right that will allow someone else to access those assets. Uh, and if some people stayed from the previous talk, uh, from like EA or just the enterprise ecosystem, this could be useful for even like KYC assets because, or like assets that require KYC, because you don't have to move them from wallet. You can just wait until the point where you actually have to move them, uh, and that's the point where you can kind of like start dealing with KYC because the actual asset didn't, you know, didn't move. Nothing, nothing happened to it. Um, so again, for us, the the case is a DeFi mortgage where we just want to allow someone to, um, you know, buy a piece of decentralized. Uh, lock it as collateral, keep that in their custody, still like allow them to use it, uh, but use the value of the assets, uh, asset as a backing for loan. Um, another example would be, you know, like DAO voting rights. Again, like you still want to use those, but you might want to utilize the, the value or, uh, that's, that's kind of backing uh, the particle token. The same goes for gaming items or ENS names are again a perfect example. Um, another useful thing, is that you can also allow um, asset renting. You can just reverse the case and essentially just give someone the right to uh, like transfer the right to someone else, but keep the token transfer right and keep the ownership of the asset um, and withdraw it later if certain criteria is met again. So this is the basic intro. And now finally, uh, now is the interesting stuff. So passing the word over to Naim. Uh, thanks, Joseph. Hi, guys. My name is Naim. Uh, before we start, for those who don't know me, uh, besides I'm being a smart contract dev, I'm also a contemporary circus artist. So I'm, even though I'm used to performing in front of people, I am not used to speaking in front of people. So I'm super nervous now. And uh, I was thinking, how can I like um, make me less uh, nervous? So I decided I want to perform you something. Uh, unfortunately, I'm jumping on a trampoline, which is uh, which cannot be fit here. So uh, I'll just show you a video of me being shot from a human cannon. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, it helped me. It helped me a lot. So, <laughs> back to the topic. Uh, let's define some requirements for this, uh, for this contract wallet. Uh, obviously, it has to act as a normal contract wallet. That means that you have to be able to call arbitrary call data on, uh, on any address, basically. And uh, the nice feature, enable tokenizing asset transfer rights. Uh, we want to enable tokenizing these rights to fungible, non-fungible, and semi-fungible assets. Uh, and one of two things it means is actually to enable the ATR token holder to transfer uh, the assets from owner's wallet. So you don't own the asset, but you are able to actually transfer it. And the second part of it is prevent the owner without the ATR token, uh, uh, without the ATR token to transfer it. So yeah, you are not screwed if you are a token holder. Uh, so high level wallet design. Uh, first, after some prototypes, we tried to implement our own smart contract wallet, uh, which is something we realized we don't want to do because we'll be basically reinventing the wheel. So after some research uh, of uh, Gnosis Safe, we realized they have uh, two very nice components. One is guard and one is module. For those of you who don't know uh, the Safe ecosystem that well, Guard is a, is a contract which you can basically link to your safe, which will check every transaction made from your safe for, uh, at the, like before and after the transaction. In our context, uh, it's a guard which will basically enforce the transfer rules, okay? So uh, if, if we see that the, the safe has the ATR token minted, but is not the holder, we'll basically revert the, the, the transaction. And that's the responsibility of the guard. Uh, the second component is a module. Uh, this enables 
to uh, execute a transaction without actually reaching the owner's threshold, which is also something we really want because we want the ATR token holder, which is not the owner of the safe, to be able to transfer or start the execution of the transfer from someone else's safe. So yeah, that's cool. With these two components, which I was like very surprised they have, uh, we were able to build uh, this ATR smart contract on top of Gnosis Safe, which is really great. Uh, we encountered obviously some challenges, so we will talk about them right now. Uh, first is approval issue while minting an ATR token. Uh, it's pretty obvious that you don't want to mint an ATR token and have approved addresses at the same time. Uh, because if you, if you do, the approved address can transfer the, the asset without even triggering the, the guard or the module. So this is obvious like a uh, thing we have to, we have to solve. Uh, next is something we called stalking attack. It's basically a type of attack where uh, I as an attacker will create a malicious asset. I will tokenize its transfer rights. I will transfer it to my victim's wallet and uh, remove it with some non-standard way. So let's say the asset can be transferred by the owner. I'll, I, as a attacker, uh, am the owner, so I'll be able to, uh, to withdraw that. In that case, the victim's wallet uh, goes into uh, into state where every execution will fail because the guard will um, not have the proper, like sufficient tokenized balance. So it's also bad. Uh, then we have challenges like EIP-1271 where the input of the function is basically just hash and signature. So we cannot like uh, enforce the rules if we don't know what is actually like verifying. Uh, then there is a gas overhead. It's a contract wallet. It's always will be, uh, there always will be some gas overhead. Plus there is a lot of checks for every execution, right? Uh, then there is the non-standard assets. Uh, we have we currently support just the standards. We cannot support non-standards asset because we are actually enforcing the the, the transfer rules, right? Uh, so, yeah, that's one challenge, and uh, not possible. It, uh, not possible to use the delegate call because then it will alter the logic of the smart contract, and again, you are all, you are able to, to to transfer it or do whatever you want with that. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, approval issue while minting ATR token. Uh, we need to check that the, the asset which is going to uh, the asset which ATR is going to be minted uh, doesn't have the approved address. Uh, currently, there is like four types of uh, of approvals. For ERC20, it's approval amount. For ERC721, it's approved ID or set approval for all. And uh, for ERC1155, it's set, uh, just set approval for all. Only one of these approved function has actually a getter for the address. Uh, so it's, it, it was a big issue at, uh, at first. But after realizing that all the approval exit or all the transactions which are approving the, the assets are done through the wallet, then we can basically just track all the, all the approved addresses. And uh, on the time of minting, we can check that the asset is not, uh, doesn't have uh, an approved address. So yeah, cool. We need, to, we need to check the approved addresses. The stalking attack, mm, how I described previously, uh, it's, it's the malicious asset which is transferred from the victim's wallet by the non-standard way. Uh, it would revert on uh, insufficient tokenized balance. And, but we, don't, we still want the ATR token holder to be able to transfer it to any asset. So because of that, we need to basically divide the transfer function into two. Uh, first is claim where uh, I, as an uh, ATR token holder, am transferring the asset to my wallet, which is cool. Uh, there is no possibility of stalking attack, so yeah, uh, we'll let you do that. And the second is the generic transfer to any address, but in that case, uh, we require the recipient permission. Uh, in this permission, uh, the, uh, the recipient can actually specify what type of asset is going to be transferred, by whom, uh, some expiration stuff, and so on and so on. So it's much harder for an attacker to actually execute this stalking attack. It's still possible, but it's much, much, much harder. Uh, but still, because it's, it's possible, we need to implement a function uh, to recover the safe from, uh, 
from that attack, which we did. That's a good one. So uh, after solving some challenges, uh, the, the final design looks like this. We actually, uh, right, you can see the, the ATR token or the ATR module. Uh, here, is the, here is the guard. Uh, it's implemented as a proxy for basically be more future-proof if uh, there is some widely adapted ERC uh, which we want to, uh, we want to like, uh, support. We don't want to force every uh, like safe owner to deploy new ones. We'll, we'll basically do like a force update for them. Uh, then you can see the operator's context. This is a contract responsible for checking the approved addresses uh, per safe, per, per the collection. And uh, our Ponce factory, just to mm, like be sure that the address we are interacting with is actually safe. And then there is some, uh, uh, some like gnosis safe, gnosis safe contract and, uh, and the owner because of, uh, of this proxy. Still, we didn't solve all the challenges. So open challenges are enable EIP 1271. It uh, will be possible if the wallet basically pre-approved the hash. In that case, we can actually check what is approved. And if, if it doesn't like break any transfer rules, it'll say, yeah, okay, you can, uh, this hash is approved. So every call for the uh, is valid signature will return to or the magic value uh, for, for this hash. Uh, guess overhead. Of course, we want to have uh, we want to have the gas cost as low as possible. So currently, minting the ATR token has a constant overhead, which is nice. Uh, which is nice, uh, and transferring the asset via the ATR token has linear overhead because it's like it's depending on number of tokenized assets in the in the safe. Uh, because we need to check that every tokenized asset after the execution is actually there and that the tokenized balance is still sufficient. Uh, then there is an issue with non-standard asset. I think this, uh, this issue will be there like forever <laughs> because uh, yeah, that's like we can work only with the honest assets. Uh, so if somebody is trying to give you his ATR token for some malicious asset which is not standard, they find some like approve functions or transfer functions, we cannot basically like prevent him to do that. And if you accept this ATR token, then yeah, you're screwed. Sorry. And uh, the possibility of using delegate calls. Uh, there is actually an option to like whitelist some addresses uh, to be able to use the delegate call or to call the delegate call at. Uh, but we cannot do it like uh, generally. We cannot say, hey, you can you can call delegate call on any uh, any address because then it's a it's a huge security issue for us. Yeah, and I think that's all. So, thank you. There was me and Joseph. Thank you so much, Naim and Joseph. Yeah. And thank you for... We, we, I also think we have two more. Thanks to Shil, though. There are two slides where... Sure. Yeah, two more slides. I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe it's stupid to put two more slides after a thank you page, but you know, <laughs> stuff happens. Uh, if you can go to thank you one, as actually, oh, <laughs> yeah, the number eighteen. Yeah, cool. So I. I realized like maybe some of the some of the graphics weren't really visible here. So if you go to uh, pawn.mirror.xyz, there is an article about the the pawn safe where everything should be described. Uh, also, you can just check out our website on pawn.xyz uh, where you can see our audits, see our repos. We have a bunch of documentation uh, for users or or developers as well. And finally, well, here's our pull up. Yeah, thanks for coming, and I think we have six more minutes for questions. Is it right? Yeah. So if any of you have a question. Anyone? There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, how are you going to handle the 
I don't remember which was the e, the EIP, the uh, correct EIP, but there was one that was what will allow you to approve and transmit at the same t uh, in the same transaction. Have you any plans for that? I think it was twelve seventy one, or something similar. Come, come again. If we want to support standard that can approve and call in the same transaction. Yes, there. I believe there was one of the EIPs that uh, that what allowed you to sign a transaction, uh, several, tra same, several transactions in the same, uh, in, in, at the same time. If I understood it correctly, uh, there is one EIP, I think it's 1373, something like that. It's a token standard, which implements another set of approved functions. Uh, these approved functions can basically approve and call arbitrary data in one transaction. Uh, we are actually supporting that. So beside these well-known 2721, 1155, we are also supporting 777 and these 1363. I'm not sure about the number now. So I hope I answered your question or it was something else. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, l uh, lending out NFTs is always a bit tricky, um, and uh, you mentioned uh, you can lend it out without uh, using collateral. Uh, how is that uh, realized, and is that compatible with any existing uh, wallets that would display NFTs? Uh, well, the idea about not using collateral is that you will use collateral but the ATR token. So basically, if I want to lend you some assets, some whatever asset, I will first tokenize its transfer rights, I will send you that asset and I'll keep the transfer rights to myself. So you are stated as an owner of that asset in the whole DeFi ecosystem, but if you stop paying me my installments or whatever, I'm still able to transfer it back from you, even though normally I'm not, I don't have the rights to do that. So it's not like uncollateralized in like very technical sense, but you are not using the asset itself as a collateral. You are using the transfer rights uh, instead. Anyone else? Yep. Hey guys, thank you. So would you elaborate a little bit about the account rental? You were talking about the, the um, like account rental or so, and the um, bribery attack for the account rental, so if I have, if I understand cor cor correctly, then we'll, we'll be allowed to rent our account on the usage of it. So how, yeah, go ahead. It was about specifically the, the assets, but now if you wanna take that one is the, is the renting case. All right, well, so essentially what, what Naim did, which I didn't realize when he was developing it, uh, but I thought it was super cool, is that um, within within the realm of um, the, the saves which have this particle guard and module enabled, uh, because you would generate them using a specific like uh, contract factory, uh, you can still uh, transfer the asset uh, to essentially like any safe that's that has that particle guard and module. Uh, and the asset token, uh, the the ATR token will still be executable, and you will be able to essentially get it from anyone anyone's wallet uh, within within that particle realm. So obviously, like you have to you have to be um, you you have to realize like the particle asset has this deed created around it, but it's essentially the same as like having real estate property and like having a deed on that property. Um, and um, then you know we can be like friends. Um, that, that wants you like reuse our gaming assets. Uh, we can have the asset token right generated. I can safely like give my you know magic sword to to Nime, Nime's wallet. Uh, I will tell him to give it back to me in 30 days. If you, I can just claim it back. And obviously you. you can you can put it into a contract. You can set your uh, set set kind of like exact parameters on like how the return should happen. Uh, but the asset token, the the ATR token is basically. The, the thing that will execute a transfer later on. Perfect, thank you so much, Naeem and Joseph.